Okay, so yesterday we were talking about the marriage limitations. And we are on page, Perkhof Aleph Pasuk Tess. Now, it, 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 there's a fascinating, fascinating concept over here. The, uh, um, the, uh, um, the, Kohen God, the Kohen has a limitation, we said yesterday, because of Kedusha, on page six, uh, 678. Because of the Kedusha, the Kohen has a limitation of not marrying a divorcee and not marrying, a, what do you call it, not marrying a, uh, a woman who has been in any relationship which is illicit. He is allowed to marry a widow. A Kohen Gadol is not even allowed to marry a widow. A Kohen Gadol, it says in Pasuk, um, uh, Pasuk, uh, where is it? Pasuk, um, am, I on the right, am I I'm on the wrong page. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Back, 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 back. Page, page seven, 674. Ve'ha-Kohen um, Gadol, four lines from the top on 674. The, 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 the coin godol, who has the Shem and Hamishcha, he has been anointed, who may lay as Yodol Lilboshes Habigodim, as Rosho Lo Yifra Uvigodov Lo Yifrom. He does not show any signs of mourning whatsoever. He does not let his hair, he does not uh, uh, let his hair grow, and he does not uh, rend his garments. Val Kol Nafshos Meis Lo Yavo. He is not allowed to come into contact with any dead bodies. Le Oviv. Ule'imo lo yitama. To his father or his mother, he must not come into contact with a dead body. Now you'll notice by the coin, regular coin, the Meshe Chochma points out an interesting, an interesting dispar- uh, discrepancy. Uh, in, by the regular coin, it says, um, if you look at the, on page 672, It says, Ki im le she'ero hakorov elov, to his near relatives, le imo ule oviv, to his mother and his father, where it lists who he is allowed to come into contact with. It says that the regular Kohen is allowed to come into contact with the body of his mother or his father, and then it lists the other people. But it puts the mother before the father. Whereas by the Kohen Gadol, it says that the Kohen Gadol is not allowed to come into contact with his father or with his mother. Lo yitama. So the Meshach Hachon is why is it reversed? By the regular Kohen, it says the mother before the father. And by the Kohen Godel, it says the father before the mother. So um, uh, uh, the Mephoshim explained that by the regular Kohen, you might have thought that as long as his father's alive, he shouldn't come into contact with his mother's body. Therefore, the Torah says, even if his mother predeceases the father, so the father's there to take care of her. Her husband is there to take care of her. Yet he still has an obligation to get involved as a regular Kohen, the Kohen Hedyot, the regular Kohen. Whereas by the Kohen Gadol, it reverses them. Even if his father dies first. So now there's who's going to take care of the mother. Even so, lo yitama, he is not allowed to become defiled. He's not allowed to become what he called. That's the first thing. Then it says, who does he marry? In Pasuk Yud Gimel, 13, V'hu isha bivsuleha ikach. He must marry a woman who is a virgin. He is not a almana, a widow, ugrusha, v'chalola zona, es ele lo yikach. He's not allowed to marry any of these women. Ki im besula me'ama v'ikach isha. Now, uh, at a deeper level, the commentaries point out that the Kohen Gadol is meant to be somebody who is an innovator. He's supposed to lead the people. Don't just follow blindly. Don't just follow <laughs> blindly. You have to break new ground for the people. You have to lead the people on a spiritual level. Symbolically, a woman who has already been married, a widow or a, a divorcee, any one of those women, that, that, that means that you're just following the pattern that was there before you. A new wife, symbolically, you know, the Torah is compared to a wife, Eish Chayel, when we say the Eish Chayel on Friday night. So why do we sing Eish Chayel Friday night? Eish Chayel, me, why do we sing Eish Chayel? Because, uh, number one, if you don't, you're not going to get a good meal from your mother next week. Right? Okay, so, but, but number two, they, there's one opinion, the Eish Chayel, it is, it, on the plain meaning, it refers to a wife, because a wife is very, you know, it, it, it just does a tremendous amount for her husband. But on a deeper level, it refers to the Torah. And that's why Eish Chayel, the word Chayel, is the numerical value, Ches Yud Lam, the numerical value 48. Eish Chayel, 48. 
which corresponds to the 48 ways that the Torah is acquired in Pirkei Avos. You know, the 48 ways that at the sixth chapter of Pirkei Avos, there are 48 factors that a person has to uh, uh, invest in in order to acquire Torah. So Eishas Chayel alludes to the Torah, which is acquired in Chayel 48 ways. And that's one of the things that we're doing now during the Surah Omer period, by the way. Uh, there, are, there is a concept that each day of the Surah Omer, the 49 days, each day we work on one of those ways of acquiring Torah, and then on the 49th day, we just kind of summarize the entire thing. This is all, I'm sure you've heard about this, about Surah Omer. At the end of the day, the Basula represents not only the physical wife, but also represents the spiritual. The wife represents the Torah. The Kohen Gadol has to be an innovator in Torah. He's got to lead the people now in Torah, not just follow what was already there and just, just kind of go through the motions. There may be new, new laws and new issues that have to be dealt with. And that's the concept of Now, I want to show you, let's go just, just so we take it further. The next section of the Torah is going to talk about the physical imperfections. And that the Kohanim, a Kohen with a physical imperfection, just read the Pesach for a second before we, before we explain all this. Uh, in Pesach Yod it says, Daber el Aaron Lamor, speak to Aaron, Ish mi zaracha, six lines from the bottom in 674. Ish mi zaracha any man from your offspring, asher bo mum, any man from your offspring who has a mum, a physical imperfection, lo yikra vlakiv lechem elokav, he is not allowed to serve in the base of Yish, he cannot bring the bread the sacrifice in the base of Mikdash. Ron, maybe we'll do your thing over there. It's a little, just a little, the air is kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of deadish. Thanks, Chaim. The, uh, the, uh, if it gets too cold, let me know so I can laugh. The, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the, uh, uh, so it says that, that, that a Kohen who has a physical imperfection, now there's a list in the Gemara in Bechoros, the Mishnah in Bechoros goes through all the various physical imperfections of a Kohanim. Some of them are actually, you know, just look like a complete, uh, you know, complete uh, what we call deformities. But something which is not a deformity, even something like a Kohen who, has, who is left-handed. Nothing wrong with being a lefty. Nothing wrong with being a lefty, especially if you want to be a first baseman. Uh, you know, a left, being left-handed is not what we would call a deformity, but it is, uh, it is what we call different. I think, what is it, 10% of the population are lefties? Well, one, out, one out of 10 are lefties. My oldest kid's a lefty. So I remember my first, my first uh, nephew was born, my older brother, when he had his first kid. So he was about, you know, one and a half, two, so he already showed signs of left-handedness. My father was a lefty. So he, the kid showed, showed signs of being a left, left-handed. So I suggested to my sister-in-law that, you know, the base of Migdash could be, could be built any day and that maybe what they should do is tie the kid's left hand behind his back to try to get him to train him to be right-handed. And so her response was, we'll tie your hand behind your back, right? So that didn't happen. And, uh, you know, and then my own kid became a lefty, my first son, first, my, my, and we didn't tie his hand behind his back either. Uh, so so the, the, why is that? The answer here is that they're going to be serving in the base of Migdash. And in the base of Migdash, there are several things that are happening. One of the things that happened, the Kohanim wear very, very uh, uh, impressive uniforms. When you see somebody in uniform, it has an effect on you. You know, ever see soldiers marching, you know, a whole, you know, they used to have these parades. You see on Yom Ha'atzibut, they have these parades. There's something very impressive about, here, the Honor Guard in England. You know, they have the Honor Guard by Buckingham Palace. You know, and people stand there watching these honor guard. These guys stand there. They look very impressive. None of them are none of them are hunchbacks, and none of them look like they're they have physical. They are all fine specimens of human beings. Because when you see something that looks impressive, you yourself it has an effect on you. When you go into the base of Migdash, you have to realize I'm in the base of Migdash. Everything here is very very impressive. A coin who's left-handed. You're all, none of these guys. These guys all have their rifles on their right shoulder. No one has a rifle on his left shoulder. Because it looks odd, it's an anomaly. It, 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 it reduces the effect on the person who's watching. So the Torah says, the base of Migdash is a place where people are, people should look respectful and it has an effect at a deeper level. The physical imperfection, by the way, the Sanhedrin, all day the Sanhedrin sat in the various Kohanim who came in to serve that day, they had to pass an inspection of the Sanhedrin. And the Kohanim that had a physical imperfection were sent away. They could not go into the base of Migdash. 
One of the, the, the commentaries point out that it's simply an indication of an internal imperfection. The way we are able to identify somebody has an internal imperfection is that HaKadosh Baruch brings about that he should have a physical flaw. And the physical flaw is a disqualification because anyway this person is disqualified because of his spiritual. It doesn't mean nowadays, by the way, if you see somebody with a physical flaw, it's not like, okay, what'd you do wrong? You know, that's, that's, not, a, that's not our, we're not, we're not members of the Sanhedrin just yet. Right? But it, 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 in, in the time of the Beis Amigdash, there was a way of disqualifying the various Kohanim from serving, from serving in the Beis Amigdash. That's what the, that's what the Torah says about, that's what the idea, the idea of the mum. Uh, uh, I think that somebody wears glasses, if I'm not mistaken, like, even, even wearing glasses is a, is, a, uh, physical, is a physical flaw in the Beis Amigdash for a Kohen. And uh, then obviously you get the modern questions of what if it's contact lenses or what if you have laser surgery like I've had. You know, they, well, what happens then? Is, uh, okay, these are all questions that are, well, I'm sure will be dealt with when the, when the base of English is around. But at the end of the day, the Torah comes along and says you're not allowed to have any sort of moon. The uh, uh, Rav Hirsch, I think it's Rav Hirsch, what's the Torah getting at over here? Why, why, what, what's it, what, what else is included in this idea? Kohanim can't serve in the base of Hashem. This I find is so, it's so, just so true. When you think about religion, right, when you think about people who are mentally unstable and they have delusions, right, what are their delusions often? What, when, when people have mental, mentally unstable people have delusions of grandeur, right, where does it usually manifest itself? This guy's either Elio or Novi, right? He's either the Mashiach in, in the Christian way. He's Yashka, you know. They got all these delusions. Nobody ever has a delusion that, that I'm uh, Steph Curry because that could easily be disproven. And a guy comes along and says, yes, I had a prophecy. I can't go prove he didn't have a prophecy. The only reason we know he didn't have a prophecy is because there says there's no more prophecy. But if a guy says, yes, I had a delusion, I had this, the, I think I'm Michael Jordan. <laughs> oh, Yeah. <laughs> we can take care of that very quickly and show you that you're not. Touch the net. Right? <laughs> you can't even touch the net. Don't tell me you're Michael Jordan. So, so you come up with something, well, yes, I, I had a prophecy. I had a communication from Makotosh Baruch And people often think that religion itself is the realm of people who are mentally, in, mentally in, uh, ill or, or people gravitate to religion because they, because they have nothing else to do in life or because they're sick or because they're mentally deranged and that sort of thing. And what the Torah wants to tell you is, hey, we're talking about the Kohanim over here. These are the people who serve. These are the people who serve in the base of Migdash. They're very healthy people. And Yiddishkeit is not an unhealthy religion. Yiddishkeit, the fact that you see people, and I'm telling you this because it's important to know, sometimes you'll see very firm people are just weird. Right? You know, you see that, right? So if you oh, see, he became from and he became weird. In my experience, it's not what happened. In my experience is he was weird and he became from. Not he became from and he became weird. Uh, making Torah doesn't do wrong things to you. Torah doesn't make you weird. Right? Some weird people gravitate to Torah. But then again, I've been at Wrigley Field in Chicago. At ball games, there are weird people there too. Right? I've been downtown Manhattan. There are plenty of weird people there too. It's not like, oh yeah, all the weirdos are at Orsamach. That's not true. That's not true. All the weirdos are at Mir. That's not true. Are there, are there going to be at hell? Like in any group. In any group, you're going to get people who some people are a little, little more feet on the ground than others. Right? But I've been in plenty of places in Chicago where there are plenty of weird people in Chicago. They're not all in a base medrash. <laughs> Some of them are in a penitentiary. They're not all, they're not all in a base medrash. So it comes along the Torah here and says, here we're talking about the Kohanim and the base of Migdash. These are physically healthy people. These are mentally stable people. And you should know that if you see signs of mental, people who in Yiddishkeit, I've told you this many times and I will always tell you this many times, there is no reason in Yiddishkeit to do anything strange. There's nothing should be strange in Yiddishkeit. Sometimes you see a guy making Asher Yatsar, it looks like he's, he's davening, he's davening like, 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 like Rosh Hashanah davening outside. Yeah, guys say, Asher Yatsar, Esa. Did you see your Rebbe do that? Do you see any of the Rebbe and Or Sameach do that? Do you ever see Rabbi Geffen do an Asher Yatsar with his hands up in the air like that? Do you ever see anybody in Beisar Rabbi Kodak davening an Asher Yatsar? What are you doing that for? Who told you that? That's Yiddish? What's that guy doing in Yiddishkeit? Yeah, see, guys, sometimes guys shaking during Shemana I mean, the guy looks like he's on a jungle gym. 
A, a guy looked like he's going to hurt himself during Shimon Esrei. He's a guy limping. What happened? I was davening Shimon. I got I got whiplash from Shimon Esrei. There's no reason to get whiplash when you're davening Shimon Esrei. Right? You ever see anybody? You ever see big rabbi, big rabbi? Do you know there are Moshe Feinstein when if a Moshe Feinstein davening Shimon Esrei? Do you know there are Moshe Feinstein stood almost still like a statue? There was none of this, you know. There was not, you know, it was like a, you know, wave a hand, man in motion. None of that, right? Once in a while, you see somebody shaking a little bit more. There's no reason. The more you shake, the more the more you shake, the less there is to shake, right? Why are you shaking so much? Where you see a rebbeim do it? That's not stable. If it looks strange, it is strange. If it looks strange, now, having said that, what the outside world thinks is strange, the Chazanish said that, by the way. Chazanish said, "Don't do anything weird." Chazanish, don't do anything weird in Avodas Hashem. I, when you go through an airport, people stare at you to see your tzitzis. That's pretty weird. We're not concerned what they consider weird. We don't think of what would they consider. I always, get, I always get a kick out of davening in airports, right? By the way, if you do daven in an airport, don't daven in the middle of the airport. Go off to, you have a right to daven, just go off to the side, right? And, and put on your talus. But I, what I do say, I, you know, I put on my tefillin in an airport and you can see people are walking past, they're just kind of like, you know, they say, you know, I do get a little bit of a kick out of that. But I do try to stand as far on the side as possible. And you have a right to daven. You go, go daven, but daven's like, don't make a, don't make a spectacle, an intentional spectacle of yourself. Don't worry. When you're wearing a white cape in, with, with black straps, there's enough of a spectacle without trying. You know, the people, people will notice you. Believe me, they'll notice you. So, so, so it, the Chazonish said, we don't do anything strange in Avodos Hashem. What the world thinks and looks at strange, that we're not interested in because it, the, 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 we think they're strange. So the fact that they think that my strings, you know, the strings sticking out of my pocket, they think it's strange, that I can't take them into account. But what we, within our own circle, there's no reason that a person should do anything that is calling attention to himself in a vote of Hashem. Yep, that, that a person, a person davens, a person, you could move shekel a little bit, but there's no reason that you should end up, I remember of Gifter, he said he saw a kala at a wedding. He saw the kala under the chuppah was shaking so hard he was worried she was going to bang her head on the floor. As they say, yeah, there's no reason a guy, 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 yeah, boom, boom, he hit his stender and mowed him. What, 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 what happened over here? Guys walking around with a bandage, what happened? Uh, how'd you get hurt? You know, I was, were you in an accident? No, I was davening. Uh, there's, no, there's no reason for that. No reason. He needed stitches because he was davening. Sometimes I hear people do all, clop, 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 avinu kichatano. You hear a clop like, like, like somebody, like, like you think you got to say yalla you know. You know yeah. There's no reason to do that. You see big rabbi go, boom, you know, boom, you know, like that. Where, 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 where is that coming from? So they, it shouldn't be, it's not the realm of the mentally unstable. That's what the Rav Hirsch says. Now, let's take it to a much deeper level. Yes, please. The coins have long eyebrows? Right. I, I've never heard of it. I've never heard of lo long eyebrows as a coin. It's, it's actually a genetic abnormality that comes with a lot of other things. Uh-oh. The Torah is identifying here a genetic abnormality that says if you have long eyebrows, I don't know about it. It's an interesting question. I'll tell you like this. All this research that they do about genetics and you know, Jewish, Jewish Kohen genes and that sort of thing, you know, I, I don't know enough about it to say how, 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 how accurate it is or how inaccurate it is. I don't, just don't know enough about the subject. It could be. It could be that there's a genetic thing about Kohanim. They say Kohanim are Ragzonim. Kohanim have a temper. So they say Kohanim, Kohanim have a temper. I don't know. I've seen, I've seen plenty of other non-Kohanim with tempers also. You know, if it would be genetic that Kohanim should have a lot of money, then we could talk, you know. That, that I'm still waiting for those genetics to kick in. So it could be. It could be. I don't, I, I, I don't know. One thing good about the Kohen Gadol, by the way, which is one of the reasons I want to be the Kohen Gadol, is that the Kohen Gadol, the other Kohanim, if he didn't have a lot of money, they had to make him wealthy. How do you like that? Hey, more it's a good. Yeah, Mordechai? Yeah. The other Kohanim had to give him, he had to make him wealthy because in order to be in a position of authority, if you have money, people respect you. Right? So yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Not only that, we don't know exactly what these describe. You know, they, 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 exactly what, how long are the eyelashes and so on and so forth. We don't know exactly what this describes. And it's only the Sanhedrin. They had to sit there and they had to check to see if somebody had these uh, various imperfections. So I don't know. I don't know. That, you know. I have seen this thing that they check genetically whether a person is a coit or not, that sort of thing. But I don't know enough about the subject. Um, 
the Sanhedrin did not do genetic testing, that's for sure. The Sanhedrin, uh, they, they, they did the, what do you call, uh, uh, based on a chazaka, based on a yichus, that sort of thing. Yeah, yo, go ahead. Doesn't it have to be well to become a Kohen Gadol? No. To become the Kohen Gadol, it's only if, if, if let's say, a father died. Uh, his son, if he is worthy, became the Kohen Gadol. Because if he didn't have money, then they made him rich. So the, uh, the, uh, uh, and then, by the way, this is a position, it's an interesting thing in Jewish law, in Jewish law, who takes over a position of authority? Let's say you have the Rav of a community, or let's say a Rosh Yeshiva. And let's say the Rosh Yeshiva dies, or the Rav of the community dies. Who takes over his position? The halacha says, if he has a son who is worthy, even if he isn't the most worthy. It means he has, the Rosh Hashiva, let's say, left a son who's a Tabat Chacham. He's not the biggest Tabat Chacham around, but he is a Tabat Chacham, and he'll grow into the position that he's the one who becomes the Rosh Hashiva. He gets the position. That's how position, that's how authority. If he's not worthy at all, if he's not worthy at all, then he doesn't get the position. So, for example, when Rav, uh, when Rav Nassan Svi Finkel, the Rosh Hashiva of Mir, the Mir, the biggest Yeshiva in the world, basically, and he was Nifter. His son, uh, the current Rosh Hashiva, Reb Lazer, Reb Lazer Yudel Finkel, was, I don't think he was 50 yet. He was in his mid-40s when his father was Nifter. And he has uncles who are, you know, a couple of generations older than him, just, just by, from, from, from a different generation. And from a scholarship point of view, there's no question that on a, on a level of Torah scholarship, there were people around who were bigger Talmud HaChemim than him, but it was hands down that he's going to take the position because he himself is worthy. He himself is worthy, and now he, he grows up. If somebody's not worthy, so the, there's a, a, a Hasidus, uh, one of the, one of the uh, current Hasidus is where the father was Nifter, uh, the, the, the Rebbe was Nifter, and he has, I think, five sons, and the, the, he, he left in his will that the, the, uh, the, 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 the follower is the youngest son. So the, the, the son was about 24 years old, became the Rebbe of the Hasidus because the father felt he's the most worthy of the, uh, uh, to grow. And the others, he just felt, were not qualified to take on the position of being the Rebbe, which, of course, led to, uh, led to you know, a certain amount of unpleasantness. But, you know, uh, you know in every Hasidus, there's always, uh, uh, there, in many times in Hasidus, you always have some sort of, uh, uh, unfortunately, there's some sort of uh, uh, dispute over the leadership. That's why some Hasidus split. You have one, you have the Hasidus, and you have the Rebbe from here and the Rebbe from here of the same Hasidus. Eventually they, you know, eventually they make up, you know, I think, I hope. But, the, but that's the, how it works as far as, the, so the Kohen Gadol, if the Kohen Gadol dies, his son, if he's worthy, even if he's not the worthiest, he takes over the Kohen Gadol. That's, that's, how, the, that's how it works. Then they make a bridge. And so I'm, I'm hoping, I'm going I'm to submit my candidacy. By the way, somebody once came to see the Chafetz Chaim. They heard about the Chafetz Chaim. They wanted to see how the Chafetz Chaim davens. You know, imagine, could you imagine watching the inspiration of watching the Chafetz Chaim David? Could you imagine the, the fires, the flames above his head when the Chafetz Chaim is David? He's a guy came to the Chafetz Chaim to see the Chafetz Chaim David. And they kid, he left his friends and said, so what did you see? He says, nothing special. That's the most special. That's the most special. Chafetz Chaim David, because there, no, there was no jumping around and there was no dust. And that, you know, there was no performance. Right? That's the most special. That's the most special. Okay, now let's take it to that like a very, very, uh, very interesting idea, a much deeper idea. If we take a look at the limitations, the Kohen Gadol, who is really the uh, pinnacle of Kohenness. So, where are the limitations on the Kohen, Kohen on the Kohen Gadol? The limitations are in the area of marriage, in the area of death, and in the area of health. Right? The Kohen Gadol certainly can't have any blemishes, can't have physical imperfections. He's not allowed to marry a woman who's been in a different marriage. And the Kohen Gadol is not allowed to come into contact with dead bodies. What is the underlying idea over here? So the commentaries point out, the Kohen Gadol is the spiritual leader of Klai Yisrael. When were Klai Yisrael, or when was mankind at the highest level of Ruchnias? When was the highest level that mankind ever got in Ruchnias? What was the highest level we ever achieved? Har Sinai which was really a throwback to what? Adam Rishon. Adam Rishon before the original sin. Now, let's say Adam Rishon, let's say there was no original sin by Adam Rishon. What would have happened? Number one, if Adam Rishon, if the sin wouldn't have taken place, there would be no death in the world. Right? There would be no death in the world. Mankind would have lived forever. Adam Rishon was supposed to live forever. It's only because of the original sin that death came to the world. 
which is what happened at Har Sinai as well when it was reinstated. He had Adam or Isha not sinned, there'd be no illness in the world. There'd be no physical imperfections. There would be no blood in the world. There'd be no blood. There would be nothing that we associate with not feeling well. There'd be no headaches. There'd be no broken bones. There would be no physical imperfections whatsoever. And if Adam or Isha had not sinned, there would be no flaws in marriage. There'd be no divorces. There would be no widows. Nobody would ever die. There were, the marriages would be perfect. Can you imagine? <laughs> of all the miracles. The marriages would be perfect. There'd be no, a marriage would be unbelievably be perfect. There'd be no flaw. Be, by the way, one of the reasons a Kohen, a regular Kohen, cannot marry a divorcee is because the jobs of the Kohenim is to unite the people. A divorcee, by definition, means that there's been separation. And that runs contrary to what the job of the coin goes. What did Aaron Hakoin do? He tried to reunite people. His job was the Oiv Shalom Verode Shalom. So a divorce represents a separation where the coin's job is to unite. The coin Gadol represents the ultimate goal, what we're shooting for. As the spiritual guide for Klai Israel, he's the target. He's our reminder. What are we shooting for? We're shooting to re-achieve, to regain that level of where we were at Har Sinai before the golden calf, which is the same level of Adam Arisha and Kodam Machet. Had Adam Arisha not done that sin, there would be no death. There would be no, which, which is the limitation of not coming into contact with dead bodies. There would be no illness, which is the limitation of the physical, that the Kohadi must have physical, what do you call it, uh, no physical imperfections, and there would be perfect marriages. There'd be perfect marriages, and therefore the Kohen Gadol has a limitation. He's got to take a, he's got to marry a woman who has never been married before. That's the idea. That's the depth of what the Kohen Gadol, what, what the Kohen name symbolize. Now, I want to go on. There's an extremely important point here that I want to get to. If you take a look at Perik Chof Beis Pasuk Lamed, first of all. Perik Chof Beis Pasuk Lamed, which is on page... Uh, 680, page 680. Okay. Um, four lines from the bottom. So it says like this. When you bring a, how does he translate it? I hope he doesn't translate it. A thanksgiving offering. I guess that's a, a, a gratitude offering. To HaKadosh Baruch Hu. L'Rtzom Chem you should, it should be to gain favor for yourselves. What is the halacha by a korban toda? By yom ahu yeyochel, on that day it must be eaten. Lo so siru mimenu ad boker, you do not leave any of the sacrifice over till morning. Ani Hashem, anything that's left over has to be burnt. Now, the korban toda, which is a Thanksgiving offering, is generally brought for one of four reasons. A person who is the Rashi Tevas of Chaim, the word Chaim, Ches Yud Yud Mem. A person who has recovered from a serious illness, a person who has gone through the desert, a person who's gone overseas, or a person who's gotten out of prison. Okay? So it's Chaim. Uh, the Ches stands for, um, I forgot how, how it works. Ches Yud Yud Mem. It's the four categories. A person who has overcome a serious illness, a person who's traveled, survived going through the desert, person who's grown across the sea, or a person who's been freed from prison. And he brings a korban, a toda offering. He brings a korban toda. And the korban toda is a shlamim. Normally, normally, a shlamim is eaten for two days. You have two days to consume a, korban, a shlamim. The korban toda, you could only you have, to, you have one day to eat the korban toda, even though it's in the category of a shlamim. That means a person pledges a korban toda. He know if depending on how you say it, if a person says, "I'm bringing a shlamim," if a person pledges a shlamim, so he has two days to eat the sacrifice. If a person says, "I am bringing a korban toda," he makes this pledge of a korban toda. He has one day to eat the korban toda. Not only that, the fact that he called it a korban toda. Not only he has one day to eat it, it's also accompanied by 40 breads. So you have the offering, and you have 40 breads, and you've got one day to do it. Why is that? Isn't it counter? The more you bring, the less time you have to consume it. Interesting, isn't it? Why? Okay. And the answer is, <clears throat> why do you bring 40 breads, by the way? Why 40 breads? What's the number 40 in Judaism? 40 
days in the desert, or 40 years in the desert. 40 years in the desert, what else? What's that? It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Where else do you see number 40? What's that? A mikvah is 40 sa'ah. Good. Where else? Rebbe Kiva was? He did tshuva at 40. Okay, it says actually, the Gemara says Rebbe Kiva lived, there were four people who lived in four units of 40. In three units of 40. Four people lived to 120. Moshe Rabbeinu, Rebbe Akiva, Rebbe Yochanan, and Zakai, and Hillel. And each one of them, the Gemara says, their life was ch- broken up into four. Rebbe Kiva was 40 years in Amma Oretz, 40 years he studied, 40 years he, he taught. So each one had you know, broken up in units of 40. What else? Where else do you see number 40? Interesting. Where else do you see number 40? What's that? After a woman gives birth, you know, 40 days. 40 days of... So the, embryo the embryo is formed after 40, uh, after 40 days. You can no longer daven. After the up till forty days of conception, you could dive in for the gender of the em- of the embryo. In other words, it should be a boy. Uh, what else? What else? Uh, what else are you? Are you uh, uh, what else is the? Where else do you see the number forty? Har Sinai. Moshe was up there for forty days and forty nights. Good. Where else? Somebody said it rained forty days, forty nights. The mikvah. I can think of two other places. What's that? He said the flood. It rained forty days. For I can think of two other places. I can think of two other places. Number one, when a person gets malchus, lashes, what does the Torah describe it? 40 minus 1. Right? Our ba'imya kenu, we say he hits them 40 times, yet we know that according to our tradition, how many is it? It's the number that abuts 40, which is 39. Which begs the question of, why not just call it 39? Right? 40 minus 1. Where else do we find it? The Malachas yeah. of Shabbos. The Mishnah in the Malachas of Shabbos, the Mishnah, when it comes to the prohibited categories of Shabbos, the Mishnah says it's 40 minus 1. I mean, if you want to be cool, so just say 50 minus 11. You know, or 77, 77 minus uh, how much? I don't, I don't even know. I won't, what, since when are you, what, since 77 minus? 38. You know, that, that, that works, right? So, so 77 minus 28. 30 or 28. Whatever it is, see, that's why we didn't do it. Right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's why, yeah. So what, what's with the 40 minus 1? It's 39, tell me 39. Okay, so the answer is like this. You see, the theme of 40, the number 40 rep- always represents renewal. The world was messed up. We're going to have to renew things. 40 days and 40 nights of rain. A person becomes tame. You need a, you, a person goes into a mikveh. I hate to use the expression, when you go into the mikveh, you remove all your clothing, and you are embedded in water completely, which is very similar to what? The baby's in the womb. Correct, because the baby was born, and it's a form of renewal. It's, a, it's, it's new, a, a new, a new form of life. A person's tummy, you go into the mikveh, hate to say it, born again. Right? You come out of the mikveh, you're a new person after being immersed in 40. 40 years in the desert, you need your attitude renewed. They were supposed to be good at going to Eretz Yisrael right away. You quetched, you complained, you send the spies, we're going to have to renew your attitude. Ultimately, even the exile in Egypt, when Avram Avinu was told by God, because you showed it, Avram Avinu said, Bame'eda, how do I know they're going to inherit the land? God said, that's a flaw in your faith. You know what you need? We need to fix that. 400 years, which is only a multiple of 40. 400 years in order to reinstate that level of faith that the Jewish people are going to need in order to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu. What else did we have in this example? Uh, 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 the embryo, 40 days. Uh, the embryo is a fait accompli after 40 days. You'll find this thing, this theme of renewal constantly by the number 40. Now, why does it go to the lashes? Why is the lashes 40 times, even though it's really 39? The answer is because when a person does an Avera, what we need is a new attitude. Got to renew your attitude. I don't like your attitude. We need to renew it. You know how we renew it? We're going to help you. The theme of the lashes is 40. But we can't do it all for you. We can only help you to a certain point. We'll help you 39 steps of the way. A little bit has to come on your own. That's the 40. The theme of the lashes is 40. It's all about renewing your attitude. But I can't do it for you. I can't help you. You gotta be a little bit. I can do some of it. I can do most of it. I'll even get some job satisfaction. I'll do 39 of it. 
But you got to take a step yourself, even though the entire attitude is, and that's the same thing with Shabbos. Why does the Mishnah call it 40 minus 1? Because the whole idea of Shabbos is to renew ourselves for the week, especially in Ruchdias, right? Isn't that true? I could create the playing field for you. The playing field, the best situation in order to be able to tap into something a little more than the physical world is to put you off duty. 39 categories that cannot distract you. There are 39 categories that are prohibited so you don't get distracted on Shabbos. So what do you do? I won't do the 39 malachas. I'll just dive into bed all day. No, that's not what Shabbos is about. 39, but you have to take that 40th step. I can't do that for you. You have to put in some energy. So we'll, it's called 40 minus 1 to remind us that the goal of Shabbos is the 40. What happens when a person comes out of the desert, a person comes out of the sea, a person who has been released from prison, a person who has survived a serious illness? It's also 40 breads because there's a renewal. And what does a person do when they feel that they're renewed? You want to thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Well, how are you going to knock off all this food in one day? What do you think you're going to do? You're going to invite the boys. Everybody, come on in. We're having a we're having a sudas hoda'a. We're thanking Hakadosh Baruch Hu. The Torah purposely puts a one day limitation because that will force more people to be there to publicize the miracle that's taking place, to publicize your gratitude. So it should be a kiddush Hashem that you're showing everybody that this is what I've gone through. I had a new lease on life, therefore we're making a sudas hoda. Therefore the Torah puts the korban toda. You have one day to take care of it, and you have 40 breads. There's a lot of food there. A lot of people have to come and join you, and a lot of people are going to share with you. That's the idea. Okay.